Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here. And again, I'd like to request order. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. One, we'll have a brief announcements period. Two, our speaker will then be able to speak on this topic for up to an hour. Then we will have a question and answer period. And at the end of that question and answer period, we will then have our infamous rebuttal period. Again, during the question period, we ask you to ask a question. And during the rebuttal period, you can speak your piece. My name is Tim. I'm going to be moderating a little bit tonight. And our speaker tonight is welcome with our esteemed round of applause, Andy Anderson. Thank you all for coming. Um, as some of you know me, uh, my brother and I run an information service. We call it a database translation service. We translate books. Like this group here is a small fraction of the books on Censor News. It comes out every year. These books, the annual that come out in October, give you the top 25 most explosive blacked out stories that would change America overnight in a heartbeat if they were covered rather than blacked out. I want to make it plain that I don't express opinions on these forensic databases. I translate a mass of books, summarize it, condense it into a one-page cliff notes you can read if you don't have time to read 20 or 30 or 50 books on the subject. So if any of you feel uh, moved to stand up and say, Andy, you're full of shit, um, we'll take a break and I'll give you the references. You give me any reference you have and we'll uh, see if there's some common ground we can meet because America is divided right now on certain subjects like never before in our history. I'm going to try to follow a sort of a script tonight. As many of you know, every one of you has ever tried to give a talk here, you know it's like trying to cram 50 pounds of potatoes into a 10 pound sack. And everybody says, well, you didn't talk about that. You missed that. You didn't talk about that. Well, yeah, we don't have five hours. We've got about 45 minutes, so I try to hit the high points. And uh, there's enough paper there uh, for all of you to make notes on each one of these things. So if you make notes of something I left out, come in here during the rebuttal time or during the questions and answer times, and let's see if we can have a, a very comprehensive discussion and ex exchange as much information as possible in the group and you can take it back and help your friends and neighbors. I had a, we got started, um, when I was in high school I had a physics teacher, Mr. Barnes, and uh, he was, we were juniors in high school. We have a book, a physics textbook open, and we'd be looking at it and it would be incomprehensible, and he'd call on one of us and he'd say, Miss Wilson, can you translate that for us into language that can be understood by your average gum-chewing American? What does that mean, your average gum-chewing American, in 25 words or less? And I never forgot Mr. Barnes. And after I got out of the Vietnam War, I started reading everything I'd get I my hands on. Right. I had never heard of Smedley Butler, General Butler. He wrote a book called War is a Racket. Well, it's in the literature. One, uh, we're going to talk about a couple of concepts that are very central to understanding what's happening in America. I had to look it up in the dictionary as a, uh, so that uh, to find out if there was actually a dictionary definition for what our senators and congressmen are doing. And it's right here. You look up, this is uh, Webster's Dictionary. The word prostitute has two meanings. One of them is basically women selling sex. The other one is to sell oneself for base or evil, uh, unworthy efforts. Like to, to take money and uh, lie to somebody about something. Uh, mm -hmm. We're seeing the Senate right now is packed to the gills 
with intellectual prostitutes that are paid to deny global warming and climate change. It's not climate change anymore, it's climate crisis. I don't know if you've been listening to the news, but people are dying in France right now from the, the largest heat wave they've ever had. They've never seen uh, even, you know, one day records and it goes back. France is breaking those records and it's a contained uh, controlled heat wave where people are just dying because of, it's at like 140 degrees in certain areas of France. They've never seen temperatures like that. Martin Luther King was famous for one, one quote. He said, any society that spends more on the machinery of death and war than it spends on social programs and things that help people live better, better is approaching spiritual death. Well, Albert Einstein said, the human race is in a race between education and extinction. I'm not sure which side is winning. Greta Thunberg from Sweden recently said uh, in November, she gave a talk to world leaders at the, the, uh, the global conference on climate change. She said, uh, I'm not here to ask you to have hope or give speeches. Uh, or support us as children. I'm here to tell you change is coming whether you like it or not. And that movement has grown into several million students that are clogging the streets and get arrested at offices, political offices, uh, cities all over the world. Currently there's a hundred and at last count there was about 130 countries and a little over two million students that have been taking off every Friday from school. They're going to school four days a week and taking off one day a week to, to try to educate their elders about the climate crisis that is upon us. Tonight's talk is uh, about the Green New Deal, what it is, who profits, um, who benefits, how to finance it. Before, uh, just take a minute uh, to start right at the top. I'm going to introduce a couple of words. I've used them in the past. Maybe they'll enter the dictionary sometime with wide public use. The two words are cribs and TC opera. A TC opera is somebody that, when, like, um, like Mitch McConnell, perhaps. Mitch McConnell says there's no evidence there's climate change, so we got to burn more fossil fuel everywhere. Well, Mitch McConnell is what we call a TC opera. He's either terrifyingly ignorant of the basic facts, he's standing in a blizzard claiming he can't see a single snowflake, or he's certifiably insane, or he's an intellectual prostitute. It's one of those three things. And since Mitch isn't in an insane asylum treating being treated for his delusions, Man's very smart. He's sharp. He's well spoken. He's one of the finest intellectual prostitutes our Senate has ever had. Language matters. These people aren't expressing an opinion. They are paid to spread disease, death, and destruction all over the world versus pollution, water pollution, air pollution to make billions of dollars for the fossil fuel industry. That's what Smedley Butler talked about in War as a Racket. It's highly profitable to sell stuff to a big machine that's killing people way more profits than in peacetime. The other word that I'm going to use periodically is this word called cribs. So that's, a, that's an acronym for criminally insane bullshit. We are daily, and you notice it's stapled to, I made this, I made these Xerox copies uh, about one o'clock today. This article stapled to that thing called cribs came off uh, common dreams this morning. And, and it was because earlier in the morning, wherever President Trump was, he said, uh, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to take any action on climate change because that would threaten corporate profits. Now there's no finer dictionary definition, no finer example on the planet of a highly paid intellectual prostitute, but also Trump has shown that he's a very, very highly skilled sociopathic liar. The man can tell more lies in a day with a straight face and make it look like common sense to his his base that's living in a Fox-generated bubble. That uh, it's, it, we're, we're inundated every day. We're just showered with a whole bunch, of, like, like living in a shower, a rainstorm of cribs. 
criminally insane bullshit coming out of the White House and the Senate and the Republican-dominated uh, governors around this country that have been making profits for their billionaire benefactors at the expense of the climate. Uh, Trump is, if you, those of you that aren't aware of it, they are in the process with his appointment of right-wing federal society politicians masquerading as judges. They are in the process of trying to overturn virtually all laws, that uh, federal laws that control pollution. Think Flint, Michigan with lead in the water everywhere. That's the goal of the billionaire predators that want to just run free again, like the robber barons of a hundred years ago. So that's where we are. The elephant in the room, the second page there, we'll just go through page by page really quick. The elephant in the room is a uh, something, it's just like the elephant in the room, the old saying, well, there it is. There's, everybody's walking around this dead elephant trying to have a tea party. Well. Language matters, and nobody wants to talk about the fact that our senators and congressmen, many of them, are very, very intelligent, highly educated, highly skilled intellectual prostitutes. They're supposed to be our elected representatives. They, they, we go through the charade that these people are elected by us, and then when they get there, they could care less what we think. You know that 80% of the public today, roughly, uh, I think it was earlier this morning, polls are reporting that something like 80% of Americans want to do something about the climate crisis. And another 70-80% ranks right up there want single-payer universal health care, like what they have in all other modern countries. These aren't radical ideas, but the people promoting them are being slandered by the mainstream media as radicals. One of the brightest young progressive people that's gotten elected in years is the woman they call AOC, along with three other freshman women. They are talking about having policies in America that were popular during the era of Dwight Eisenhower. We had affordable education. We had affordable schools. We had 91 per tax rate, 91% rate on the excess money of the filthy rich. Once you got me up on a certain point, it was the excess was taxed at 90%. 91% in the Eisenhower years coming out of World War II built a thriving middle class. We built the interstate highway system. So we have to we have to recognize that one of the reasons our country is not moving fast toward a Green New Deal is that we have intellectual prostitutes that are paid by the fossil fuel predators to say we have to burn it and blow it. Um, some of these people come from churches that taught in 1987, we'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns, but this one has to be destroyed first. Now, to me that sounded a little insane back then. And I think it sounds insane to most people today. That burn as much fossil fuel, nothing we can do about the climate, uh, the end is coming, uh, Armageddon is coming, and uh, you'll just disappear in the rapture when the first bomb hits, and then we'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns. They actually teach that shit in some mega churches. Today, um, I didn't make enough for everybody, but anybody that wants one, there's a flyer that's eight pages. I made a few copies. A mega church in Florida. Um, any, anybody see or read about the um, the prayer invocation uh, that was given by a, a pastor called uh, Paul White? Does anybody and that, that name ring a bell? Paula White has been flying under the radar. She's part of uh, the group that uh, involves Amway's Betsy DeVos and these other far, far right-wing Christians. Well, she gave the, when I, I, they were talking about this on the radio and I, 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 I ran off the road. I had to pull into a parking lot. I was laughing so hard when I heard this. She said that Donald Trump is the best Christian leader we've ever had and he was sent by God to lead us out of the darkness. Donald Trump was sent by God, and it's up to us as all good Christians to get out the vote and energize other big mega churches and turn out the vote and keep Donald Trump in office for at least another four years after. Don't let the evil Democrats or progressives, people that are steeped in evil, don't let them vote out our, our good Christian Trump. But how deluded, how out of touch with the reality do you have to be to believe something like that? There's kind, decent people 
all over the country uh, that you can't talk to on certain issues because they're living in a bubble and that, that's what these books on censored news talks about. Uh, Gene mentioned a book, there's something going on in America that was developed in the late 50s called the tobacco strategy. The tobacco engineers, I mean they sell tobacco and cigarettes, I think it was around 1959, 1960 that they got together and they said uh, our primary product now is doubt. We're, our primary product won't be cigarettes, we'll be selling cigarettes but our primary product is going to be selling doubt to the American people so that Congress won't do anything because this is well-known cigarettes cause cancer and heart disease and everything else. So this book, Merchants of Doubt, describes the tobacco strategy and how it's been used by corporate media to create doubt on several key issues where there is no doubt. We would not have 100 nuclear power plants running on American soil if they didn't create doubt and slow down uh, the building of uh, it. As it was, 103 got built because this, the original scientists that developed uh, nuclear bombs and everything, they knew what the waste would be like. And, and as it turns out, the current generation of nuclear power plants we have are known to be the most expensive way known to man to boil water. That's what they are. It's a very expensive, like a Rube Goldberg machine, that is, those things are so complex that there is no way to forecast the different kinds of failures that they can have. That's what they found out running nuclear power plants, that once you get beyond the area of complex, complexity, there's no way to forecast the modes of failure. And recently we're seeing that play out with the Boeing aircraft that had the software that would uh, cause the plane to go up and down. Is that the, which one is that? Seven or four? 737 Max. Seven, uh, seven, 737 Max. Max, yeah, I didn't memorize. But see, the, uh, the software was so complex that the pilots didn't, couldn't, couldn't react to it in time until it was going on until the plane crashed. And that's what you get with things that get more and more and more complex. In our industry, we tell people, steer clear of those thermostats that you can talk to with your smartphone, because those things are economically unserviceable. And if your house gets too hot or too cold, all you can do is shut the power off, rip it off the wall, and install another one. You can't troubleshoot those things. And they, they work okay when they work, but they're not telling you. The people that sell those things are not telling you that, number one, they're economically unserviceable. Number two, they're hackable. If, they, if you can talk to your house from 500 miles away on vacation by, by the internet, somebody else driving down the street that sees you're not home can hack in and raise the temperature at 100, or turn the furnace off and let it freeze to death in the wintertime. I mean, freeze solid, you come back home broken pipes. That's what it means when your house is online and you're connected. They call that a smart house, right? Has everybody heard that term, pretty much? Well, it's smart for the people that are making fistfuls of $100 bills selling these things. Okay, we'll just dive right in here and um, what should we do? Somebody said, what, what was that? What will we do? What should we do? Are well, we uh, you know, there, there are modern programmable thermostats that No, are, not, I mean about the planet. About what? The planet, the Green New Deal. I'm something. talking about that right okay. now. The Green New Deal, what it is, is basically it's an outline, a plan. There are some simple books that describe, if you don't have time to read 50 or 100 books on this, I'm going to summarize it in a few minutes, but there's some really good books. This one is called Unprecedented Climate Mobilization by Elizabeth Woodworth, Woodworth and David Ray Griffin. It's a, a small book, you know, like 110 pages, but it's a summary of what can be done to mobilize everything. Like this, this book could be considered an outline for the Green New Deal that uh, Senator Mar Mark Ed Markey was it in uh, AOC. Those two uh, outlined that a, month, a couple months ago. Naomi Klein's book. This is available on disc. For those of you that don't have time to read books, you can get it from the library. I listened to this thing about four months ago. This book was published in 2014. It's called Naomi Klein. This changes everything, capitalism versus the climate. And it makes a very, very strong case of how the drive for profits with unregulated capitalism 
is the single driving force that's destroying the environment along with the United States war machine, the military industrial complex is the largest killing machine on the planet. The biggest single entity for a polluter for greenhouse gases and the biggest single killing machine with 800 bases all over the world. We have to address those things and Censor News has been addressing them for the last 15 to 20 years. But right now, The Green New Deal simply is an outline, as I said, on a wide range of issues. Naomi Klein said, if we address the climate crisis and solve it, we're going to shift over from our current for-profit destructive capitalism in the for-profit destructive war machine. We'll shift that money over to building all the people who stay employed. Nobody's going to go unemployed. Like the coal miners, if they can still work, the ones that work can be given uh, better jobs in the new green energy. If any of you haven't noticed yet, there's companies in Illinois that are putting up solar panels for free all over the place. The installation is free now. There's nobody down, and you can start collecting cheap electricity right off the grid. Commonwealth Edison actually promotes that because it helps them. People feed energy into the grid, and they don't have to run their expensive power stations anymore. ComEd wants to be like the Illinois tollway of the grid. They'll just charge everybody a toll, coming and going. And uh, the wind machines and um, the big wind farms, the solar farms, they will feed hundreds of megawatts into the grid to replace ComEd's you know, nuclear plants that can't compete anymore. The coal stations are out. No coal station can compete anywhere. Coal stations are being propped up with what we call corporate welfare. Welfare for the wealthy. That, that, that's how we have them. In summary, Darja Mayo published a book called The End of Ice. And I, I, did, I didn't get that with me tonight. It's called The End of Ice, and uh, there's pictures in there, all kinds of pictures of the glaciers melting and how much the ice has receded over the last 10 years. What they found is it's happening way faster than what they predicted like five years ago. They're having to downgrade their predictions and say, this isn't going to be happening in 2040 or 2050. It's happening now. It caught all the scientists by surprise when they did the last yearly studies, they went out on the glaciers, and uh, there's no ice where it used to be covered with ice. And uh, you know, the Greenland, if, if Greenland continues to melt, that's going to raise the sea level about 20 feet in the next few decades. So you think think Miami and a whole bunch of other coastal cities underwater. But before that happens, the heavy storms, the, the hurricanes that are bringing in floods. Who cares if Miami's under five feet of water if they just get flooded out and wiped out every year by a couple of hurricanes? Same thing. Can Texas handle the four feet of water that happened in Houston every year? That's well, what they, they're looking at during. What can they do? What can we do? What can they do? Well, they can't do anything. They have to move the buildings. People have to abandon where they're trying to live, where it's flooding, and they're talking about trillions of dollars being spent over the next 20, 30 years to relocate cities away from the coast or just abandoned buildings that are going to be underwater. It's not really feasible to build dikes to try to hold the ocean back or the what floods. Happened, what's going to happen to the kids of this generation? Well, this is what my talk is all about. I was getting a little late getting here. I, I drove up to my brother's house in uh, McHenry. I met him halfway because he orders stuff on the internet. And this book came out of England. It says Greta Thunberg. The title of it is No One is Too Small to Make a Difference. This is a description of Greta and the millions of students that are protesting. They're working with a report. These kids are working a report that came out last August that said, by 2030, if we haven't got off most of fossil fuel, the, the air, the atmosphere is going to warm up a little bit more, and the rest of the ice is going to melt at the North, South Pole, and Greenland. It's not going to happen fast, not not in two years, maybe, unless we have a, a methane burp. If you know, you know, They call it a methane burp. The last time uh, a whole bunch of permafrost melted and methane went in the air, which is 20 times worse than carbon dioxide, the planet warmed up 11 degrees in like a decade and, and uh, it wiped out a lot of species. Nobody is talking about that yet. What they are talking about is 2030 is the absolute closing of the window of opportunity. It won't make, it won't make any difference what we do after 2030 because 
flooded cities are going to be locked in and the ice is going to be melted. We have a critical window of opportunity right now with a World War II type mobilization, a timeout. Our country and a bunch of other countries took a timeout for four years from 1941 to 45, right? Guys left college, they took a time out, they enlisted in the military, women went to work, the auto industry stopped making cars, they started making trucks and tanks, and that's what happened. So, how you doing, Mike? Or Jim? I'm oh, sorry. You, you, gotta, you gotta, gotta move away from the back there, or what? No, I have to collect some money. Oh, 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 our tax collector is running around collecting tax the dues. Collector. Sorry, I didn't Tax need collectors it. here. Lost my train of thought there. I thought we had, had some kind of crisis going on with one of our regular patrons. <laughs> anyway, um, the climate scientists now, uh, 97, 98% of all Academy of Sciences all over the world, are in solid agreement. 2030 is absolute latest date to have a chance to prevent the worst of catastrophic climate change that will be snowballing like a snowball rolling down a hill picking up speed. After 2030 we won't be able to stop it. Nothing the human race is going to do is going to make any difference. People are going to be looking for caves, higher ground somewhere, you know, just go into survival mode over the two or three decades after 2030 as you can see. Uh, you know, we will probably already have coastal cities flooding by 2030 at the rate these hurricanes are picking up speed, flooding Miami, and look at what happened in the Midwest. Didn't we have record floods here in, the, in this country that nobody's ever seen before? And look at what happened to the farmers this year. Farmers, climate change, has, the jet stream changed. We made it almost to July 1st without having air conditioning weather in Chicago which is unheard of. You have these giant swings. It might be 75, 80 in the daytime, and it's down to 52 at night. Oh, April, May, early June. We've never seen weather like this in Chicago. Nobody has. In France, they've never seen weather like they got over there. Northern Sweden have massive forest fires. We're seeing the effects of the changing climate is going on all over the world. In the American media, especially here in Illinois, they're not covering it. The, 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 the Wall Street Journal, Daily Herald, Sun Times, Trib, USA Today, Wall Street Journal. Those five papers, the editions we get, had no mention, zero mention, of the big nationwide, worldwide walkout on March 15th. Now, if you're a decent investigative reporter, how can you miss the biggest student event in, in, in ever? You know, and then it happened again on May 20th. You'd think they would have had time to brown up, you know, study up a little bit and learn what the students were doing so they could cover it on May 20th on Friday. Again, I bought all the new papers Friday, Saturday. The Illinois Press totally blacked this out because the message is we have to leave fossil fuels in the ground. That's the message. And the powers that be, the billionaires that own the media, they are keeping this out of certain areas and cities. I can't speak for other cities, but the students are overriding them in California and other places where you have uh, more forward-thinking environmental movements, uh, these groups of students, 13, 14, 15 year olds, you know, hundreds of thousands of them, Extinction Rebellion in England is, they've shut down the city of London three times now, just brought it to a standstill for a few hours by camping out, clogging the bridges or clogging the streets. You know, tens of thousands of protesters and the police can't handle it. And the kids are saying, we got no future. We have nothing to lose. We're not here playing hooky because we don't like being in school. We don't have a future. You know, we, we'll be lucky to get half as old as you old farts are. By the time we got, you know, you, th you worry about, think about Trump is complaining about migrants coming across the border. Well, the migrants coming across borders here and in other countries is a tiny fraction of the people that are going to be heading toward higher ground as is the coastal cities where half the world lives become uninhabitable from hurricanes, floods, fire, you name it. So that's what what the kids are facing. Who benefits from it? You can summarize that. The only people that aren't going to benefit from the Green New Deal we outnumber them maybe a billion to one, well, a billion to one. 
from every millionaire or uh, billionaire that's going to have to be satisfied with one billion rather than ten or fifteen. They're going to consider that a huge loss. I was looking at twenty billion in the bank. Now I got to live on a billion a year. And it's, it's going to be painful for them psychologically because they're geared toward just scooping in money through the welfare for billionaires program that the United States runs. The other 99.9% .9 of us, people that need breathable air, people that need clean water, people that need affordable housing, people that need affordable education, all on down the line, everybody benefits. And as I said, that the benefits and how fast it can happen, again, is summarized in Naomi Klein's book. You know, I'll, I can't, cannot stress that enough. This this is the best book on it's on disc, 17 discs. You can get it at the library. This changes everything. Capitalism versus the climate. It, it describes how 99% of us will have better jobs, better income, better health care. It's not like a commie plot to take over America and, and steal all the stuff we have. <laughs> that idea that this, we can't pay for it, or when, when, when our senators and Congress say, well, it would be nice to have gold green, but we can't pay for it. That's a giant load of crypts. That's criminally insane bullshit. And they know they're spreading it to create doubt, to muddy the water. We just, we just get, it's like, it's like a fan pointed at you and somebody is pouring liquid cribs into it, bullshit, just flying at you all day. What can you learn if you, you, you're hunkered down under an umbrella to keep yourself buried, uh, avoid getting buried by criminally insane liquid bullshit? Now, what would it be like if somebody had a fan up here and every now and then they'd pour a cup of some liquid slime and it would go out over the audience. Would that disrupt your a concentration a little bit? What, what can people learn? If I'm trying to give a talk here, but every two or three minutes, whoosh! <laughs> More criminally insane bullshit in the form of some kind of foul, toxic liquid just comes out there and you just have to try to avoid it. Well, that's what all these tweets coming out of the White House, it's the game plan is and with the robocalls, the same thing. The robocalls are destroying people's ability to contact each other the, uh, and because people aren't answering their phones anymore if they don't recognize the number. And they're waiting to see if somebody leaves a message. Is that and, and the, the government? Ro robocalls have completely destroyed our ability. Like Is that the government? The mm -hmm. Is that the government? Is that the government no. doing that? Like the no, we don't know. We don't. The robocalls are coming from several. It, you know, sometimes it takes years to find out that the government was behind a program that was supposedly run by some company, right? Try to save up the questions so uh, we'll have questions and answers coming up here in just a few minutes, uh, and, and we can have a, you know, a good discussion there about some of these things. And of course, the last thing on uh, on this so the Green New Deal sheet, the the third part is. You know how to pay for it well we are already paying for it we're already paying for it there's we i, I wish i had a, a copy of uh we printed one called the, the trillion dollar triangle there's three giant myths those three myths are responsible for a couple of trillion dollars a year being wasted down the rat hole one of them is the myth that our soldiers are fighting for freedom and justice in war and land you know, that's that's almost a trillion dollars a year if you add everything up on its own going down the military raffle. Another one is the health care pharmaceutical company raffle in this country. Sell a bottle of pills for eight dollars in Australia, sell the same pills for eighteen hundred dollars here in America. And AOC had a uh, there's a clip of her interviewing a guy in Congress. She asked him, he says, Why is this eight dollars in Australia and eighteen hundred in America? He said, well, you have to remember in Australia, they don't have patent protection. In Australia, basically what he's saying is in Australia, they don't allow price gouging. They don't allow you to yeah. kill people by withholding medicine if they can't pay for it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm working on another article. Maybe you guys can have some information, ideas. There's an old biblical saying, you know, by their fruits shall ye know them. By their actions shall ye know them. Forget the rhetoric, look at the words. 
by their actions, what do the American drug companies, what are they saying to us? I'm sorry little Johnny is dying because you can't afford $20,000 a month. I need my billions. I'm, I'm sorry your kid died because he couldn't afford the, uh, insulin, but if a few people die from lack of insulin, it'll motivate the others to sell their homes and borrow money and everything else. So compared to the immigrants that going back and forth across the Mexican border, there's at least as large immigration from this country in, over the border, back and forth in the border of Canada to get medicine that costs 10% as much as it does here. You just go across the border to the pharmacies and buy stuff right over the counter in the pharmacies. A $30 vial of insulin for 30 is $320 in America. What's wrong with that picture? And so we are seeing uh, John McMurtry uh, published that book, The Cancer Stage of Capitalism in 1997. He said, once capitalism reaches a, a stage where the billionaires have a massive amount of money and they can own politicians to pass laws, once they own the legislature and the government, they will get bigger as sharks. They'll eat everything in sight and destroy the country, basically. And that is exactly what we're seeing in America. One thing after another, education, health care, decent police coverage, um, who needs SWAT teams coming into your house to uh, arrest somebody for a, a couple overdue parking tickets? Mm -hmm. That's basically what we got going with the SWAT teams preparing for when they're really needed, when they want to in, you know, arrest militants or protesters. Right now, there's no, the pictures in England, I think it was pictures coming out of England, I think it was England today, but I'm, I'm not sure. There, it's uh, showed up today, there's police spraying mace into a group of about 30 or 40 children, kids, middle school kids and some high school kids sitting on the ground peacefully protesting. And uh, one, one guy last week said, you know, it, 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 if we start firing bullets into them and killing a few of them here and there, it's going to be bad optics. You think? It was bad optics when they fired into that group at Kent State and killed four students back in 1970. Well, this is going to be really bad optics when they start killing 12 and 13 year old boys and girls that are protesting for the future. So we're, we're in a war, you know, many different religions tell you, you know, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. That's another one, right? Well, take a look at some wolves we got in our government. We have the highest percentage of what's called foxes guarding the hen house that this country has ever seen. In fact, it's like there's a neon sign over the White House, uh, invisible but blinking for people that can see it. If you have no ethics, no morals, and no conscience, and if you've already been involved in some shady activity where, where you were arrested and prosecuted but got out of prison, come on down. We got a job for you. We want to put you on one in charge of one of the federal agencies. If you have no ethics, morals, and conscience, we want you. If you have a shred of decency or honesty, if you want to help the American people get cleaner air and water, those are qualities that will disqualify you from being in the Republican Party. They're, they're weeding out anybody that has decency, ethics, or morals at the highest level for just run down the list of Republican senators. I mean, it's unbelievable. Really, we call themselves senators. I call them intellectual prostitutes. But we have, and these judges, the other thing, another thing that's slowing down the, is that they're packing the courts with politicians that have been raised and groomed by the federal society to call themselves judges. They're not judges in any sense of the word of fairness and honesty. They're politicians that want to rule against lawsuits where you file a lawsuit like Flint, Michigan for poisoning the students, lead in the water. These judges will throw the case out. And, and, more, and the only thing that's getting done in the Senate right now, and our intellectual prostitutes and the media are not covering it, is all of these judges that are being rammed through in the Senate with no debate. And the press is totally blacking that out. They are not covering the fact that the only activity in the Senate, only bills are getting passed, are they're voting in these right-wing judges to pack as many of the federal courts as they can before Trump gets chucked out of office. And uh, you know, all these judges are coming from what's called the Federalist Society that was formed in 1982. So, question. Uh, I think the last thing I would say, you got a piece of uh, literature here with a picture of a, a train on it. 
that says we can be, yeah, there's uh, five handouts up here. You can take one of each. If anybody that got here late, just come up here and get the literature. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. Avery Lovins, when he was traveling around talking about energy efficiency, he used to quote coach people and say, you're trying to develop a new kind of efficient motor or a new kind of efficient pump. He said, what you're trying to develop has been on sale at this wholesaler for the last two years. What exists already should be considered possible. That's why we're, we're inundated with a, a giant load of cribs telling us, well, that'll never happen. Well, that'll never fly. People wouldn't like that. And people all over the world have been working with it for the last five or ten years. I mean, the, the, the disinformation that comes out of the press is, is um, they said Richard Nixon probably wouldn't have been chucked out of office. He, he probably wouldn't have been able to beat the rap if he'd had Fox News to shape and mold uh, public opinion and, and uh, keep people in a bubble of un unreality. But he didn't have Fox News back then. They learned from that. They learned from the Vietnam War. They learned from what happened to Nixon. And they said, we have to have our own media that can shape and mold public Got opinion. It? And that was, for those of you that might not have known it, that was the Lewis Powell memo to the Chamber of Commerce in 1973. Lewis Powell later became a Supreme Court Justice. But he was one of the founding brain, it was his brainchild to found something like Fox News, the Federal no. Society, the whole right-wing media machine to shape and mold public opinion so that if you hear something 1,000 minutes and you hear some of the truth only a half a minute or a minute, you inundate people with a message a thousand to one, and that's the message that sticks in people's minds. And that's the genius and the brilliance of Fox News. The journalism schools around the country now are using Fox News as a, a teaching tool. They say this is how you maintain people in a bubble of ignorance. This is how you do good propaganda and make it look like news. So it's about 7.15 right now. Uh, do you want to open the, the question? Uh, let's see if I have. Uh, yeah, basically, the, in summary, I, I would say uh, there's also the, from uh, the movie Sir Thomas, and Sir Thomas More, Man for All Seasons. If anybody you saw that, he just, he described, he told his daughter what, why he wouldn't sign the oath, why he was silent on it. And everybody in England had to sign an oath supporting the king and supporting giving the blessing to the king's divorce back then. And Thomas More was a devout Catholic. They didn't, they said divorce was wrong, so he wouldn't sign the king's oath. And everybody was getting aggravated, the king was, because he was a respected man. He wouldn't go along with the program. And he, he, he described to his daughter, he said, the maximum of the law is means silence means consent. If you're silent on something, it means you consent, not that you object to it. And I think uh, European countries have laws that prevent something like what happened in New York years ago when, what was it, 27 or 28 people looked around from windows in, a, in this apartment complex where a woman was being beaten and killed That's outside. Amazing. Nobody, well, where was that? Does anybody remember where that, that was a famous case. In New York City. Was that it? was in New York City way, way back, 30 70. or 40 years ago. In the 60s. In the 60s, yeah. But uh, other countries say, you know, if, if you're watching a crime in progress and you don't call 9-11 or lift a finger, you can be prosecuted as part of it. Because silence means consent. And there's 300 million of us. And Donald Trump is supposedly our employee. We pay his salary through taxes. But he doesn't care about salary. He's getting millions from laundering money for the Russian mob. That's why he doesn't criticize the Russians. The people he's been doing business with for the last 20 years, you, 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 you ruffle their feathers. They don't kill you. They kill your family. And then Donald Trump has been laundering money for the American mob and the Russian mob in, in bed with mobsters you know, his whole life. That's his, motive, his method of operation. Just massive amount of crime throughout his whole life in real estate. But if we had honest investigative reporters in the media, he wouldn't be there. He would have been impeached or removed after it became obvious that the election was fixed. There's no way Donald Trump got elected. He got the least amount of votes. They changed the vote tolls in certain states. They trashed Democratic ballots all over the country in certain key states. And that was the most corrupt election they've ever had since the Supreme Court just stopped the vote and gave it to young George Bush. 
you know, we, we've had corrupted elections since George Bush was in office, and it culminated with the installation of Trump to just let the billionaire predators run wild. So if, if there's any hope that we're going to do something about climate change, climate crisis, we have to face the reality of who is obstructing the common knowledge that 80, 90 percent of Americans want on a variety of these issues. And a lot of it, you know, I think it was uh, Scotland, I think the government of Scotland has already made a deal with the Extinction Rebellion Greens and they're voting in green legislation. They said, if you stop protesting and shutting down our offices and our city and our roads, we'll, we'll start to go green now. So the kids are having a huge effect all over the world and the reason for that is that their press does a better job covering it. I think we have, um, among the so-called free countries, our, our media is tightly controlled by, by billionaires that don't want the news to get out of certain things. So there's just 8.20 a.m. every day, uh, Tom Hartman talks about good things that are happening all over the world. That's uh, 8.20 a.m. You have uh, wealth of websites, Common Dreams. A lot of these articles came off the website Common Dreams, incidentally. A couple of them came off Smirking Chimp. Um, Common Dreams, Smirking Chimp, and Truth Out are three of the very best for environmental and green articles. Okay? So, um, with that, uh, we'll wrap it up and go to the questions and answer section. So, who's got a question here? Thank you all for being attentive. Listen, I gotta well say, done, Andy. considering uh, the weather and the conditions, this was an excellent crowd that toughed it up. So, or is everybody getting acclimated more or less, and they're going to take a good shower when they get home? Right. Or we got no air part of the climate change. <laughs> okay, you got your hand up over there. Start over there. Andy, uh, you made a uh, good point of mentioning uh, this. Uh, uh, Greta was her name. Um, Greta Thunberg. Uh, Greta, it's Thunberg, T-H-U-N-B-E-R-G, but if you can't remember her whole name, remember Swedish Girl Greta. Just Google that. Swedish Girl Greta, all kinds of hits come up. Right. Now, now there's a lawsuit uh, going through our courts uh, brought by uh, uh, the young people, uh, bringing up the uh, fact that the uh, government has uh, subsidized the oil and gas industry. Yep. You know about that? Can you tell us more about yeah. that uh, and where it's at? Uh, do, you, do you know off the top of your head? Uh, because they've made progress. Uh, the judge just ruled that it can go forward. Yes. So they, they're going to have a court date uh, very soon when the evidence, well, they have a court date soon where the evidence will be heard. What the uh, a bunch of kids, uh, the lawsuit was a bunch of kids, about 20 of them, got a lawyer, an environmental lawyer, and they sued the government, the U.S. government, for destroying their future. They said, we have a right to clean air, clean water, and a viable future, and the government is involved in destroying it. We filed a lawsuit in 2015. <clears throat> the judges have delayed it. You know, they've done everything they can to dismiss that, but it hasn't been dismissed because it's a slam dunk for the evidence. And so it's going forward. Then 60 Minutes last week uh, did a, a, a segment on that, on that lawsuit. So a follow-up on that, that would presumably uh, be able to subsidize a lot of things in the Green New Deal if, if the government has to pay. Well, I, I, what I meant to say was we're already paying for the Green New Deal. There's a couple trillions of dollars a year going down rat holes. If we just transfer that money, the people will stay employed, but the billionaires will have to take a hit. They won't be able to make collectively an extra trillion or two trillion dollars a year. We'll have to get some sort of fiscal sanity, but the taxpayer dollars flowing into these three myths, you know, the medical, industrial, pharmaceutical complex is a huge one. 9-11 uh, funded the myth we have Homeland Security. We have you know, the Department of Homeland Security, we have ICE, we have these SWAT teams that have militarized police all over the country. There's billions and billions and billions of dollars is being wasted on that every year. We turn, we reemploy those people in doing all kinds of things, making Green New Deal, uh, well, road, uh, electric trains, wind, wind farms, weatherization of houses, 
new appliances, all kinds of stuff. People can be employed to make uh, what Buckminster Fuller called the design science revolution. You make all kinds of machinery that will help people live better, the best technology, rather than continue to waste it on the military and machinery that causes death and pollution. Does that answer your question, kind of? Well, I was just <clears throat> going to say that this would take the hook off some of the politicians that are, don't have the courage that if the government is forced to remedy the situation, then these politicians um, well, we're rapidly on, heading we're rapidly around. heading toward that point where the government, local governments are picking it up. Uh, it's a, uh, some government, um, a federal judge it was on the news today. Some federal judge just issued a permanent injunction against. Uh, Trump continuing to build a wall uh, down there and along the border. Their uh, states are beginning to fight back and saying, we're not going to go along with Trump's insanity. So, you know, it's the press is not covering it. You have to listen. You have to listen to the progressive stations and the progressive uh, websites. The, you have a question over here? Yes. Go ahead. What is the emergency broadcast system for? How would that help us? The emergency broadcast system. Emergency broadcast system. Broadcast system. Broadcast. Oh, she asked, how do the emergency broadcasts help? Well, they're not emergency broadcasts. They're the radio station broadcasts the news every day. You know, it's, they're called progressive stations. I call them common sense. They're not left wing or communist or socialist or anything like that. They're talking about things that are common sense mainstream knowledge that 80% of Americans go along with. And incidentally, if you go into Republican deep areas where they think Trump is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and you ask them individually, do you think there should be no program to help your kid if they get lead poisoning, you should just let your kid die? People say, no, you know, they don't, I, I, would have, I think that's wrong. You, you ask, don't tell them whose political party is promoting this stuff, but just ask. Do you think it's really right that you have to mortgage your house or something to put a kid through college? You know, it's, it's amazing that, that the bubble of ignorance politically exists over people that are common sense, ordinary Americans, just like millions of people nationwide. But the media has been maintained a section with those mega churches, <coughs> keeping a reliable block of mostly older people to get to the polls and vote. I call it the night of the living dead. They raise up off the couch and go to the polls and vote for Republican criminals. Other, but they look like ordinary citizens. I, I have a sister in New York. I can't talk to her. And she thinks Trump is the second coming of Jesus. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. But I mean, um, I can't speak about that without saying that it's flat out insane. And it's like people would think that those young guys in the Middle East that were told, well, if you carry this bomb, if you're a suicide bomber, there's 17... Seven, there's 72 virgins waiting for you in, 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 in the afterlife. How can you convince young people to do stuff like that unless they're in a religious cult? And there's incidentally, there's a book out now, I think, called The Cult of Trump. Trump supporters exhibit all the characteristics of people in cults like the Hare Krishnas or others that are just, they're immune to information coming in from the outside world. And that's what we have to do, help people learn things one at a time. You had your hand up, and then you're next. No, that was me. Uh, during, the, during the debates last week, uh, the moderator asked the presidential candidates, who is for, raise your hand if you're for Medicare for All, and most of them raised their hand. Don't they realize that there's a, a, a 120 million uh, Americans, mostly older voters, would lose their private insurance? Plus, Medicare for All would cost a, tri a trillion dollars. Now, don't you think that the Democrats are going to go down big time if, they're, if they push Medicare for All? The question he asked is, don't we think that the uh, Democrats are going to go down big time if we push Medicare for All? He, he very articulated, a very, uh, in a very articulate way, he gave us a, re a presentation of the myth that's promoted by Fox News and the other right-wingers. The idea that Medicare for All would cost more than what we're paying for private insurance now. That's a fairy tale, a myth. We are already paying for Medicare for all, but the money is going into the bank accounts 
of the billionaire owners of the drug companies, the billionaire owners of the fossil fuel, if we had single-payer Medicare for all, all the studies show that our country would pay about 50% as much for health care as what we are paying under our current private system. So people would not lose their health care. They would lose the ball and chain that they're anchored to right now from a private insurance that's taken thousands and thousands of dollars a year for giving them poor coverage. And the leading cause, uh, I think they said the leading cause now in this country of bankruptcies is medical debt. And the leading cause among people, bankruptcies, that people that have insurance, medical insurance, is medical debt that the insurers didn't pay. There are big loopholes in all these private insurance. Just because you have private insurance doesn't mean that you're not going to get a, a 50 or $100,000 bill you can't pay. It's, you know, the idea that we have affordable health care in this country is one of the biggest myth pieces of mythology that's ever been promoted. And, and it's a way we have to debunk it. She had a question over there, Kim. I was just going to ask for well, Say that, and we'll be right there. It seems to be the consensus here that Republican politicians are corrupt, but I can think of so many Democratic politicians that are corrupt. I think, I think that we're inundated with corruption yeah. from everywhere. I don't think there's any one part of She said, I, I, I can answer that. Uh, they, you know, we're not, there's massive corruption in our political system. But all you need to do is take over one party, take over one party virtually totally, and then have a small percentage of corrupt politicians and the other one that will vote with them to make a simple majority. That's what we've got. There's a lot of, you notice the progressive candidates aren't taking money. There, there's a drive in this country to get people elected that aren't corrupt. And virtually every one of those people is running for the Democratic side because if you're not corrupt, you can't get elected in the Republican Party. They're looking for people that have skills in corruption and lies. The second part of my question is, is if, if Trump wins in 2020, are we going to chalk that up to some more corruption and not the electoral college? Because I, I personally, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I believe that there's corruption in a lot of elections going back to Kennedy. He was not supposed to be president. It was supposed to be Nixon. And the original Mayor Daley swung that election for him with corruption, and that's the only reason Kennedy became president, and that was a Democratic organization. So, because well, you said that the corruption goes back to the Bushes, I think it's much earlier. But anyway, besides that, if Trump does win next year, is that going to be due to corruption? If Trump wins next year, it will be due to massive voter suppression of people are trying to vote him out. Only about 25% of all the voters in this country voted for Trump in the first place. 75% of about 70 to 75% of the people in this country hate Trump. If they're given a, a fair chance, an opportunity to vote, they'll vote him out. But you don't you don't think the electoral college played any role in? Voting? Well, the electoral college absolutely played a role. They you know because they installed Trump when he didn't get the uh, total number of votes. But you have to remember... But many presidents have won that way. Well, uh, but still, th th this was singularly corrupt. But uh, to answer your question, if Trump wins, it will be because we had uh, gerrymandering. The Supreme Court just issued a ruling that says you can draw the maps anyway. They're going to be trying to gerrymander more districts the, the Republicans are working uh, feverishly to try to rig this next election so that an overwhelming Democratic majority can be suppressed. Because, uh, let me put it this way, every, I don't know many people, we're all on the same page. Everywhere I go, I don't see anybody that thinks the pedophile priests are doing a good job with the kids. That's because we all know we're all on the same page. The country right now is divided between people that know who and what Trump is, the real truth, and the people that don't know yet. The people take a little time to study and look at who and what Trump is and what he does and look at the people he's appointed. Every, virtually every high office has been picked 
by people that have massive criminal tendencies one way or the other. We have criminals run. No, no, no. That, that, hey, time out, time out. That's a giant load of cribs. I don't know where you've got it, but the idea that every president runs the country with criminals, that's criminally insane bullshit. No, not, not, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that presidents, whoever is the president, has a lot of power while they're president. They, and, if, and if judgeships come up in the Supreme Court while the president, they choose the Supreme Court justices for us. You're right, but you see, the thing is, up until now, up until about 1982, the presidents didn't start packing the courts with right-wing judges. They put in people that were, uh, we had a lot of Supreme Court justices that had reputations of fairness and decency and honesty, and they would, they would hear cases on the merit. They wouldn't just rule against the public in favor of corporate billionaires. That's the difference between Republican administration and Democratic administration over the years. Uh, hold on, we got other questions now. Okay. Uh, Tim, uh, uh, no. Ted, Ted in the back there. You had your hand up for a little while. Is the Green New Deal uh, a set of specific pieces of legislation that with numbers and all that, or is it still conceptual? What, what? Well, the Green New Deal is, to, uh, they're working uh, on various pieces. Uh, they can't get anything through the Senate right now, so the House is passing bills, and supposedly, these things, if we get control of the White House and the Senate in 2020, then all these beneficial bills that help the environment and everything else can get passed. But see, the news media is not talking about anything that the Democrats are doing. The Democrats have been passing all kinds of beneficial bills and pieces of legislation in the House, and if they could get it voted in the Senate, they could probably pass some of this stuff. And, you know, if there was, uh, all you need is a few senators with a shred of a conscience to go with the, the Democrats that are in, in lockstep about trying to do something beneficial for the country. So uh, that's the problem. Now, if, if you log on to Common Dreams every day or Truth Out, you'll see uh, one one bill after another is getting passed, uh, beneficial stuff. You know, the, the Democratic Congress isn't just sitting back doing nothing. So, so, uh, uh, specifically, Green New Deal legislation? Is it labeled Green New Deal legislation? Um, or is it just amorphous, you know, just general? Well, they, they haven't passed anything like that yet. Uh, their, their bills are in progress. We'll hear more about it over the next month or two. As, as more, you know, their bills are being prepared and worked on. And, but they, have, they, they just have other critical things going on and they can't do everything in two months. But it's, it's happening. Ellen. My concern, like yours, is, but specifically, I wonder if that Green New Deal, sometimes it seems like the, like the Republicans and the Democratic Party, the two-party system, use prop, they use statistical analysis to come up with something like a Green New Deal that, you know, sounds like Roosevelt, sounds like big taxes, and I mean, is, am I just being paranoid that this was almost developed to? It's like they they instead of looking for what the people want, which there's no statistical representation of the big ideas that come up there. But the Green New Deal, I'm just suspicious that it sounds like it, it costs a lot of money, but the kids want it, so well, buy it. Uh, Helen, you know? Helen asked, is the Green New Deal uh, you know, some kind of government program that, um, well, it's going to be a program worldwide. You know, pieces, you know, the main thing is we have to stop burning fossil fuel at all levels. So Rocky Mountain Institute just put out a piece of it. They didn't call it the Green New Deal. They called it um, um, a way to retrofit 70 million buildings, homes in America so that they can shut off the gas to their furnace and go all electric with solar panels on the roof or getting all electric solar electricity from the wind farms. The electricity from wind farms and solar farms and off the roof now, that electricity is cheaper per kilowatt than utilities generating it, and all the utilities know it. And so we're, we're going to be going all electric in the next few years. It's just how much big business is going to be able to slow the change down and keep us using eight-track tapes for music 20 years after the CDs came out. That's, that's basically what we're looking at here, and that's why it's an educational process. The kids are saying, we don't have time to go to college and get educated and everything. The crisis is now, and like Greta said, 
We don't need to go to school for anything. All the solutions are here. What we need is action now. The climate crisis has been solved. They know what to do. They have to override the politicians and the billionaires and get something going. That's that's what it is. Tim's next, and then All right. You know, I took a good look again last week at so-called uh, renewable Germany when they made the switch to renewable energies. I found that their coal consumption has gone up quite a bit. Their coal? Their coal consumption has gone up quite a bit. They have the highest electric rates in Europe. And what they're doing is supplementing a lot of their base load power from France by buying the nuclear energy from there. Can you comment, please? Yeah, I can comment. Uh, Germany, they said they're burning coal. Germany is beginning to phase out coal plants as fast as they can get solar and wind up. Also, this is a temporary anomaly. Uh, France had a lot of excess nuclear capacity. And so they, uh, as France is going energy efficient, they have a lot of excess electricity. Their nukes are already built. They're already paid for. So once a nuke is already built and paid for, this, uh, the taxpayers subsidize it anyway, then the kilowatts coming out of it look cheap. And it'll look cheap until you know they have a Chernobyl or something like that in France, and then that'll be the end of the nuclear power plant, nuclear power industry over there. But there's no, you know, just as a global thing, the cost of solar silicon panels has dropped 95 percent in the last 20 years. Solar electricity is cheaper than fossil fuel or nuclear power anywhere in the world. But the nukes are entrenched. They have uh, billions of dollars. The utilities call them as stranded assets. When some they don't want to shut down something that they can still use, they they want to try to get a rate of return on it. They're, and of course, the people that are running nuclear power over there, uh, they're just looking at uh, trying to supply kilowatts and you know pay off some of the debt. They're not looking at uh, what could be done to really uh, promote green energy. But, uh, it'll be we will have an updated talk on this in another year. But the anomaly where, as Greta said, you know, uh, emissions have been going up even though people have been talking about energy efficiency alternatives because you have these anomalies everywhere. But once everybody gets on the same page, it's going to be like, hey, none of us like the pedophile priest. We're all on the same page there. But well, we weren't 15 or 20 years ago. Now it moves forward in the direction of truth. Uh, Charlie. Oh, no, I'm sorry, David. He had his hand up before. Thank you. Thank me for what? For letting me have my turn. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you said earlier this evening that Donald Trump is an intellectual prostitute. <laughs> and I want to say that my experience with Donald Trump has indicated that he has been a devout capitalist. So shouldn't Donald Trump be the owner of an intellectual whorehouse and not simply be an intellectual whore? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Uh, you know Donald, Donald Trump is highly skilled at telling lies with a straight face and then uh, claiming he didn't say something two minutes ago, three minutes ago. The man just passed his documented 10,000 lie while still in Congress. That we never had a president like that. Well, you know, when you say intellectual prostitute, um, Donald Trump is doing some certain things to help the fossil fuel industry. Now, did he get campaign contributions for them? I think he did, getting elected last year. You know, Wall Street backed him, the fossil fuel industry. Uh, you know, the country hated Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was not uh, the, the greatest Democrat. You know, we were given an impossible choice to vote for next year, and that's why so many people just jumped off the Democrat-Republican train and voted for Trump, because Trump was coached on what to say. Well, we'll bring the troops home. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll make affordable college. Every one of Trump's prowesses turned out to be 180 degrees ball face lie. Once he got control of the White House and his people, he started hand-picking people that would do absolutely the opposite. Uh, well, you know, Trump has, now we don't know if you ask if Trump owns a stable of intellectual prostitutes. Well, I Trump, didn't ask you that. Didn't you? Oh, you didn't say that. No, I said shouldn't Trump 
be the owner of an intellectual house of ill repute huh. ra rather than an intellectual press. Oh, okay. Well, I, I can't tell if, 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 if Trump would do any better being uh, the owner of an, uh, a regular whorehouse rather than intellectual. No, I said intellectual whorehouse. Uh, well, Trump already has appointed intellectual prostitutes to run his government. Right. Sarah, Sarah so then, Sanders so is a classic he example. Be the owner of an intellectual house of prostitution Just say and yes. not be yeah. an intellectual prostitute. I think I have to agree with you. I'm glad you got that square. <laughs> Charlie, you got a question back there? Yeah, you say you in your hand out, Andy. You talk about living wage jobs, and I hear a lot about a green economy. I went on a tour of all the solar installations around Chicago last year. We had a bus tour. I didn't see one person working. The government. Later on, I did went through the solar wind uh, farm. If it's a crisis, farm. yeah. I still didn't see one person like working. Well, uh, you know, the question is, if you look at a solar installation... I don't see any... So where is this green job? Well, you have to go out to anywhere where they're putting up a solar system. The, the, the crews from New York, there's five-man crews that work two days to cover a roof with solar panels. And then one of our customers got one. I found out about it a few days ago. So this, you know, they're, they're not working on the, around the house for the next two weeks. They hit a house in two days. They're there, put up the inverters, well, that, electric this lines. It's a little bit like uh, jobs like, uh, what are they called, cable guy jobs? I, I don't, so I don't know. Put up a, you put up a solar panel and plug it in. Right. Use four screws and you're done and you go on. Well, it's two days worth of work for ten people for one house and there's millions of houses. What? You can put a roof on, a new roof for that many people. <clears throat> well, it's, this, on, is, this isn't on roof, Charlie. Ten people. Charlie, um, I, would, I would ask you politely to inform yourself on the actual reality of what the work is, how much they get paid per the hour, how many days it takes them. The solar industry, it's, it's commonly reported in many journals that more people are employed in the solar industry than are, uh, are employed in fossil fuel that is coal or nuclear combined. Mm -hmm. The solar employment in this country is huge, <clears throat> but they, well, it's so not I steady. It's, I, I didn't see anyone working. Well, you weren't looking where they were working. What, what, you got to go what, look where they're working to see the work people. You put in the installation, right. yeah. you turn it on, it's virtually maintenance free, there's no moving parts. Right. So I don't see where the, where the employment aspect is. The employment is they're converting they have an option to convert 70 to 80 million buildings in America to solar. 70 to 80 million buildings are going solar and, and they're, they're putting up panels as fast as people sign up. I ride the train all the way from the south side. Just, I live almost directly opposite right. south to this place, location north. How many solar installations do you think I see on my trip? Well, you might not see any. They might not be putting them up in that corridor. They're working in, in different places. I'm crossing the entire city, Andy. You've got a narrow, narrow window of, you know, looking on the train. If you, if you drive out to the suburbs, you see solar panels going up in every town out there. <laughs> Somebody said there's a bunch in Lincolnwood. You just have to go where they are. They're, they're not suddenly going to appear everywhere. They're, you know, they're, they're targeting certain areas because when people see it and it works, then it's I'll easier to sell. Me. You just told me they're everywhere. And now you've got to tell me i got to go to a specific place. I, I, okay, let me, let me be very specific. When I say everywhere, virtually every town in the western suburbs have crews working. But there's thousands of homes that don't have any. Yeah. You can drive for a couple miles and not see a solar panel. Yeah. Because, uh, but then you, you hit another stretch, you'll see five or six of them and uh, at half a mile to a mile. It depends on the location. Uh, you know, they're not being, they're not being installed on a, like a, a grid, you know, one every two miles or one every three blocks. It's not a smooth grid. You can drive for miles and not see anything and then you'll hit a patch where you see a bunch. That's how it goes. And that's why I say you can you can drive in certain areas you won't see a single wind machine. You drive down to Indiana and you see a couple thousand of them. That's where they are. And you know these things are. This is the nature of renewable energy. Ellen, you got a question? Yeah, I wonder. Are there um, states like California 
where they're trying to be more um, green and the Trump and Trump is still fighting them on that? And could you speak to that? Trump is trying to fight green energy everywhere because any green efficiency cuts into fossil fuel burning consumption. Trump, the Trump administration is in the process now of trying to roll back any emission controls on cars so that the automobile industry can start selling big gas guzzles again. We thought we were making progress on that, but we're going backward on, on environmental regulations, uh, health regulations. He's trying to repeal. If you're going to try to destroy a country by repealing all things that would help protect people and their lives and the environment, it would be the Trump administration. If there's a state of emergency, who would, who would, how would they contact us? There was a state of emergency. Well, the uh, the only only emergency contacts I know of are the uh, on Tuesday morning is at ten o'clock. The air raid horns go off. They and they'll have a warning on TV. You know, uh, an alert, what you call it, a civil defense alert or something. It happens on Tuesday, once once a week, every week. That's and they would they would contact us in the event of emergency by radio or TV, or or, or the horns even. or the well, I don't know, be text. Uh, who hasn't had a question here yet? Any, anybody hasn't had one in the back? we we got to go to uh, rebuttals in a couple Let, minutes. Let her go. She's got one. Yeah, another question? Actually, I wanted to make two comments. The we, comment we, is after fail. the question and answer period. We'll have a chance. Yes, for the comment. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, that's okay. That just you ask a question if you want. Um, if you got a question. Otherwise, you can come up and rebuttal. No, I just want to share She's making a comment. All right, why don't you, she's new to the college. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and share your thought. We're not going to be that Nazi-like here right now. I am. I think we can all look forward to Trump failing on, on rolling back anything um, in the car industry. I personally drive a Prius, and I see tons of them out there. I get 53 miles to the gallon. I'm spoiled rotten. I'm never going back to a big gas guzzler. So the car companies can make anything they want, but I'm going to drive a hybrid till I die. So well, I, I, and you're once you have one, you're, you're spoiled. So. You're talking about free enterprise. Yes. Right. We're free to buy a high efficiency car if we want, but if you don't maintain certain mission controls that make cars more expensive, if you get rid of all those controls, people go for the cheapest in America. And if you can buy a car for three thousand dollars less than somebody else's car, that's what people are going to go for, well, and they're not going to. Well, the price of gasoline as it goes up, people aren't, aren't going to think that car that's a few grand cheaper is such a bargain if you're paying five six dollars for a gallon of gas. You're going to think that. Well, goes. we aren't at five six now. They're maintaining it. They're maintaining it so Americans drive gas guzzlers, and uh, we're being maintained that way. And incidentally, the, uh, the one thought she has. Priuses are available in America, but they get 53 miles to the gallon. They have hybrid vehicles that are in the 70, 80 mile gallon range sold outside the United States. High efficiency vehicles that really get really good gas mileage are not for sale in America by law. It's one of the things the Green New Deal is looking to change. Car companies have had 100 miles per gallon prototypes tested and run since 1980, like 40 years. So they could just, we could jump to 100 miles per gallon in decent sized cars if they want. Like, Charlie, you got one? Yeah, like the Green New Deal that I read said the private automobile is by no means ecological. And you can consider the energy that goes in to making it, the, the, the roads which have ruined the environment, you know, having a bad concrete and asphalt, and anybody who says that an automobile like this, even that, whatever the mileage, is ecological, is contrary to anything I read in the Green New Deal. Well, you missed it's the part. It's a matter of getting high cars, hybrid cars. I didn't say that. We don't need a Green New Deal, do we? What do we need, Charlie? We just need automobile dealerships. <laughs> Let's take a moment. Really? Give, That's give, all you need is Take a moment and let Charlie collect his thoughts. No. And I'll answer the question. What's the, what's I'll answer your question. It's got a thing at transportation. You're, you're playing the devil's advocate yeah, again well, to try to muddy the water. I was just talking about being showered with crypts earlier in the time. Did you read the section on transportation? They're talking about electric high-speed trains. They're talking about high-speed rail. Uh, and not cars? Not uh, roads? Electric cars, Charlie, run on solar. Yeah. We, we, uh, if you didn't know, Volvo is going all electric next year, 2020, 
Uh, the coach uh, that I work with at South Middle School, he's driving a solar powered car right now. No gasoline. Are you opposed to public transit? No, I think we should you have, have better public transit. It. You're what? talking about hybrid cars. You didn't talk about trains or any alternative transportation. Well, you don't have to talk about alternative transformation much because that's a no-brainer. The Green New Deal, if you saw that handout I gave, there's a picture of an electrified high-speed rail, a train, right on that thing that Alexander yeah. Cortez is promoting. They're promoting high-efficiency high-speed rail to get off of a flying in between oh, cities. In you know, China, they have 300,000 or whatever, 30,000 electric buses, and they don't sell electric cars. Well, China is making a bunch of electric cars right now. No, electric buses. The number is, I've seen 10 articles on this. Well, That's what they're at. Everyone is talking about this. Electric buses? Yes. Everyone. Well, that would be part of the Green New Deal, would it not? Well, you haven't mentioned it. You keep talking about, you what? say they're buying electric cars. Time out, cars time out, time cars. out. Time out. Will you hear when I announce that this is like cramming 50 pounds of potatoes into a 10-pound sack? I want to hear. You said everyone should go out and buy an electric car. I didn't say that. I said they're going to be available. A lot of people will use public well, transportation it. in cities. No, I'm not, Charlie. You that don't give me that bullshit. Okay. Just, just cut it, cut it off. All right, let's go to rebuttals. He has one last question over here. The, uh, 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 Trump says that. Uh, uh, when the sun doesn't shine and wind doesn't blow, there's no electrical en energy. There'll be blackouts and brownouts all over the United States. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to have blackouts and brownouts all over the United States and when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Well, that, that's part of the bubble of mythology that's promoted by Trump and coming out of uh, the fossil fuel media to say we have to burn fossil fuel, we have to have nukes, we have to, think, have to, think to run 24 hours just be a day. backed up by natural there's, gas. Um, there's uh, utility sized battery storage being developed. Wind farms that have the ability to put electricity into the lines hundreds of, uh, hundreds of miles apart. Once you get a lattice of wind farms, the wind is blowing sometimes everywhere. You don't just have a dead time. But you can have uh, water storage tanks, pump water that will run generators, turbines for a while. There's all kinds of energy storage for when the sun doesn't shine. Also, buildings can be made to store their own energy so that uh, you can uh, collect enough energy to run the refrigerator, lights, everything else during the day. And you can get through the night because you won't need a furnace. The house won't even get cold. You can get by on a tiny amount of electricity for heat in a normal house. Uh, all of these things have been developed over the last 20, 30 years. What I'm telling you about is in, in existence in various countries all over the world. It's just not talked about here, especially in the Illinois press. You can search in vain in our newspapers and radio, and you don't hear any of this. And as far as I know, we only have one common sense progressive station on the air in Illinois, and that's 8.20 a.m. Everybody else is right wing, right straight out of Fox News. You're dead wrong them. about that, my friend. Well, if I if somebody can give me another progressive station, a radio station, I'd like to hear it. 91.5 FM, WBEZ. We've oh, got to okay, go to rebuttals now. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's have a show of hands. How many people want to give a rebuttal? Almost everybody, right? Down at this one, two, three, uh, four, five. Ellen? Get your hands up if you want to give a rebuttal. Hold them up so I can get a count. One, two, three, four, five. Ellen, you two, yeah. six, ten, seven, Charlie, eight, nine, ten. That's ten people. Okay. Three minutes, roughly. We should have, yeah, we should have enough for maybe three and a half minutes per piece. If, if you watch it, don't run over. Make it a four-minute cut, firm cut Try off. Try four minutes and we'll see how it goes. Because that'll give us about four minutes. All right, thanks. Let's see your speaker. Thank you all for coming. All right, rebuttals. Uh, Andy made uh, a statement concerning the uh, um, Quran in which he attributed to Muhammad the statement that um, if you die in service to the Islam, or if you kill yourself in service to the Islam, Islam uh, 72 virgins will be waiting for you. Uh, 
in uh, the afterlife. Um, that's a misinterpretation of the Quran. It, it actually is a, uh, the way Muhammad wrote it is that if you do all those things, there will be one 72-year-old virgin waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, tr a tr a Trump wants to build a wall across our southern border to stop illegal immigration. He wants immigration reform to stop the lottery, chain migration, uh, anchor babies, and sanctuary cities. Also, asylum has to be reformed. Uh, the, the Democrats have introduced legislation for health, education, and welfare for, for the health, education, welfare of aliens. This was cost billions. We have our own poor people. Why do we have to pay for these aliens? All across Europe, the people are protesting the influx of refugees. George Soros was kicked out of his native Hungary for his radical agenda. United Nations say they want all countries to have no borders. Over 140,000 illegal migrants are coming over uh, America's southern border every month, 140,000. Th that's the same population as South Bend, Indiana, 140,000. Anyway, uh, Trump says we don't want the crime, drugs, the unskilled, and the job displacement and problems of cultural assimilation. The, the, the Democrats want 20 million refugees for their future votes. Trump is concerned for the future. What's wrong? Someone turn off the... No, you're yelling into the mic. Okay, don't I'm sorry. Just mic. tell me that. You don't have to turn it off. I, I don't turn yours off. I just turn it down. It wasn't okay. turning it off. Okay, just leave it You're yelling a little loud. Can you hear? Okay, you can hear. Okay. Uh, Trump is concerned for the future of America. He's not like the Democrats, bringing 20 million people for votes. Nullify your vote, my vote. <laughs> We have our own homeless. We shouldn't take in the poverty stricken, stricken of another country. The United States will still have, will, st will, st will still take in refugees, but they must come in legally. We must build a wall and use the border patrol and drones to control our destiny. With the growth of, of national populist movements in Europe and the United States, the public has turned against immigration. Open borders. They turn against open borders and multiculturalism. Uh, that's people who, who get the real facts to, to fight all this open borders. They're also against the crackpot socialist ideas like the Green New Deal. I believe that. Good evening. Uh, I saw on television not too terribly long ago a, uh, a program called The Little Ice Age. And uh, while we have scientists here who are on the left and they try to scare the daylights out of us telling, telling us that uh, the sea levels are going to continue to rise and the ice is going to continue to melt, uh, some years ago, the same scientists were saying that we were facing global warming. Now they don't call it global warming, they call it climate change. And uh, so if, it's, if we have a severely cold year, it's climate change. If we have a severely hot year, it's climate change. This way they can be sure and be on the winning side. However, uh, the little ice age had occurred around the time of the pilgrims. And uh, it's one of the things that was responsible for America being discovered and for the pilgrims coming to America and all of that sort of thing. Uh, we, according to our better scientists on the right, they claim that our uh, uh, climate change is a deal that 
is off again, on again. That it, it get, we go through a period where it gets cold, then we go through a period where it gets hot, and that this has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. So it's really a lot of bunk to say that you better get down on your knees and pray and stop driving cars and stop having emissions and that because we're going to uh, have the, all the sea levels rise and everything. And that's BS. Uh, also, uh, what I'd really like to hear from speakers like uh, Andy Anderson is I'd like to hear a more balanced uh, uh, talk on these different things where they sort of give both sides some uh, credibility. Uh, for instance, he mentions that uh, Donald Trump, that, that the Trump people bought the, the election in so many states that uh, they uh, made that happen like that. But uh, I remember when John Kennedy ran for president and that uh, there were uh, quite a few incidences of states being bought. Uh, Gore Vidal talked about one of the Kennedy people down south who left his briefcase in a barber shop and came rushing back and the barber said it's right over there and he, the guy grabbed it and opened it and uh, the barber and the other people in the barber shop happened to see that it was filled with about $250,000. So uh, the Kennedy people were buying the election where they could and Joe Kennedy even remarked. Uh, they said, well, your son won, but he didn't win by a landslide. Joe Kennedy said, if I wanted a landslide, I'd have bought one. So elections have been being bought right down the line before Kennedy and since Kennedy. So, but, but according to Andy here, this is the first time that it ever happened was with Donald Trump. Give me a break, will you? All right, next three butter. Thanks, Andy. In the movie Jaws, uh, the final minutes, uh, there's these three guys hunting a monster. And in this analysis this evening, given by uh, my friend Andy, it's kind of uh, possible we could say the monster is uh, our refusal to live in balance with Mother Earth. So these three guys are uh, chasing the, this monster on the sea, and in the final minute, uh, it's obvious that the ship and the tools they currently have aren't up to the task uh, to catch the monster, and there's this very memorable scene when they're frantic, and one of the crew calls for help from the Coast Guard. Mayday, mayday. And the captain sees this and he's incensed and he gets out his baseball bat and he starts smashing the radio up into a bunch of pieces. You want a bag? And the yeah. guy says to the stubborn captain, You're certifiable, you're certifiable, you know that? And it reminds me of the term that uh, you've adopted, Andy Cripps. Uh, so, uh, there are captains that we have suffered our whole lives whose brains are the, uh, you know, the stubborn uh, captain's equivalent is we the people's government. Uh, yeah, give me one thing. Corporate greed, corporate militarism, and corporate ecocide. And you'll notice I don't use the term climate change or global warming. I use the correct term that they use in international courts right now to charge corporations for killing our planet ecocide. That's mm -hmm. the correct term to use when you're killing a living being, no. which the planet happens to be also, even though some of us uh, <coughs> think it's just a big garbage dump. Um, so mm -hmm. how do you uh, raise a generation of people who refuse to be greedy, violent, ecocidal, sociopaths, and psychopaths. Well, you have to have a curriculum based in sources of non-corporate information because we've been lied to our whole lives by corporate information. So some of the non-corporate information that are very important, especially in election years, when possibly the difference of the candidates is tens of thousands of Americans losing their jobs, homes, health care, savings, and clean air, clean water, and clean food in their communities being a thing of the past, 
and as a uh, domino effect, tens of millions of people in other countries losing those important vital things to life and quality of living. Uh, some of those sources are Free Speech TV, Link TV, RT America, which, yeah, it's, it's Russian television, but America funds all kinds of television in other parts of the world. It demonizes all kinds of governments also. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think that uh, RT America is anti-American. I just think it's telling the truth about America that no one else has the guts to tell. WCPT is great, Andy. I agree with you. This is Hell Radio with Chuck Mertz. Right here out of our own Chicagoland area is great. The Nation Magazine, Z Magazine, Progressive, In These Times, Jacobin, ISR, Mother Jones, and occasionally C-SPAN is really great. I heard this crazy socialist on there recently from the great state of Vermont. I forget his name, but I think he was talking about something like forming a more perfect union and establishing justice and ensuring domestic tranquility and promoting the general welfare and securing the blessings of liberty. So. Uh, even uh, even in the belly of the beast, the truth is finally coming out. Thank you, Andy. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, I guess you might have forgotten who I am because I haven't been here for a while. Uh, Doug Binkley, I write under the pseudonym or noun de plume of uh, D. H. Robinson. Um, I haven't uh, been able to get here that easily. Uh, for a few months, I've been without a car. And actually, reducing my carbon footprint has sometimes felt pretty good. Um, and uh, so uh, I didn't feel a need that I had to just, uh, you know, throw my uh, financials haven't been in such great shape either. So I haven't felt a need that I had to uh, invest in, uh, in a car lately. I probably will break down and do that. But in any case, um, I think it's uh, uh, important uh, if we can um, do what we can to help save our planet. Um, Global warming or climate change, whatever you call it, um, they're just uh, words. Um, but uh, the, even though this uh, climate in the Midwest has been cooler than usual lately, there's a special uh, cold spot. The rest of the world, you can see if you look at a heat map of the world, which I did recently, uh, it's much hotter in other places. And of course, uh, as Andy pointed out, um, France is, and the uh, rest of Europe has had um, much uh, worse uh, heat waves than usual. So. Uh, I just uh, want to re-emphasize that, um, and um, I've sung this before, um, I'm, I'm a writer, um, and one of the things I've done is uh, write some alternative lyrics to some songs. Um, so as some of you know, um, I've imposed uh, this on you once before, but I'm going to try to do it before my three minutes are up this time. Um, this is uh, an alternative to the uh, national anthem. Um, using the same melody, which uh, there's no copyright on, because as it, most of you know, and if you look it up, um, you can research that uh, this was a tune that was used for like a drinking song in, in, in actually in England, uh, and it was adapted to uh, um, the, uh, a warmongering type of uh, lyrics. But what I will sing here is the environmental stands that I call it. Um, oh, say can you feel the global warming? The environment under our pressure degrading. The deserts increasing and more violent storming require persistence in a task unrelenting. The deniers how creed, the corporation's greed, convince concerned people to act on the need. Oh, say we all work to make our planet less hot. For you know this is true. It's the only earth we've got. I just decided about a half an hour ago I was going to try that. My um, voice is terrible. I've been wondering whether I'm going to lose it entirely. I don't really know for sure about that. But it seems to have stabilized, at least uh, for the moment. So um, this is a serious problem. It needs serious people. It needs all of us. And if necessary, to get in the streets. As I mentioned before, uh, during the announcements, uh, we had something like 17% of the population of Hong Kong out in the streets recently. And they had some effect. Now, 
everyone will have to get off their duffs, especially if there's uh, going to be large protests. We need everybody yeah, on board. I realize that the movement has been fragmented to some extent, and everyone has their own private issue. But this is the issue of the survival of our climate, our livability of our planet for human beings. And so it is of dire need that we all be on board. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Andy, as usual. Uh, can you all hear me well, or was that turned down too low? Yeah, turn it up a little, little bit, bit, I think. <clears throat> um, anyway, so uh, Andy uh, talked a lot about uh, intellectual, or he mentioned <coughs> intellectual prostitutes, um, and, but he referred uh, mostly to Republicans, um, or he emphasized Republicans. The Democratic Party is the second corporate party. It's the second uh, party of property and it performs its function very well. Uh, you have one team, and when that team, uh, it, it, its term is up or it stumbles, you put in another team. It's the same uh, set of teams with the same set of goals. Um, as a class, politicians are useless, and worse than useless, they're criminals, okay? Practically everybody, I think there was only one dissenting uh, vote on the Iraq war, a transparent lie, a transparent uh, uh, crime, uh, imperial project. Um, I think there was only one vote against it. Um, there's an occasional Dennis Kucinich, an occasional Ron Paul, an occasional uh, uh, AOC. Okay, those people who are truly progressive, and all that means is they re represent the, the mass of the ordinary people. They aren't far left or you know for, truly radical. They just are truly representative. That's only a small percentage, a tiny percentage of uh, the politicians in Congress. Okay, uh, Democrat, and they're, they, they happen to be Democrats, but they're only a handful. The Democratic Party as a whole is uh, just as bad, if not worse, than the Republican Party because they deceive you into thinking that they're the people's party. It's a pure democracy. So uh, we, this system of ours uh, has to go. Uh, Andy said we have to override the billionaires and the politicians, something to that effect. How are we going to do that? Our government is hijacked. Our, our government is hijacked by both major parties. You have to get rid of the system. You can't be electing. Yeah, you can't be going to elections and voting for some jackass or some other jackass for 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 one monster or another monster, for one liar or another liar. When they get in there, they do what monsters do. They do what liars do. They do what jackasses do. All of them, except a handful of, of, of exceptions. And they have to have that handful of exceptions, or you would think everybody would know that the that the whole thing is is a, is is a fraud, right? So they have to have those few exceptions. They allow them in there uh, to do their uh, to fool us, basically. So the whole system has to go, and there's just no two ways about it. And that means that we need an entirely new uh, political system. And you can go to raft, R-A-F-T-D uh, dot org, that's Revolutionary Alliance for Truth and Democracy, and you can see a model of a modern, what a real modern democratic government would do, what it would look like, a, a modern democratic political system. This, it, this system that we have <clears throat> is not democratic. It's never going to give us uh, anything like justice or, or equality uh, among classes or anything of the sort. It's never going to uh, fix the environment. It's never going to save us uh, from what we have to do for, from what Andrew talked about. We need an, an entire new system. Thank you. All right. All right. Hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, I always say that because uh, I love this free speech forum, and it's my one chance to get my three minutes in each week. And uh, the only thing they don't know is you can go back and piece all these things together and come up with an ad for running for uh, running for office but I I agree with what Ted said just then and uh, I mean everything Andy says uh, I've talked about this stuff a lot and the the question that drives you is what's the solution and um, and it my one thing I've brought up here uh, this book understanding the F word American fascism and the politics of illusion gives a definition of fascism uh, that um, I'll read. Fascism is a system of government characterized by rigid one-party dictatorship, forcible suppression of opposition, private economic enterprise under centralized government control, belligerent nationalism, racism, and militarism, etc. But um, and then 
right in front of the, the, this book by David McGowan, he, he points out two-party system. We think we've got two parties, but we really don't. And they're picked from the top. I mean, I, it is an illusion that I used to have. I, I, I joke that I was an adult child of a Republican family, you know, and that or libertarian, and I just had to come out of the closet and be fully democratic. Well, basically, I uh, tried running and found out that, you know, the, this kind of union guy brings me in and says, oh, you could be clerk, but, uh, you know, you'll have to put in a couple of our guys, and you, you have to say kind of, we'll help you figure out what to say, you know. Um, but uh, we, could, well, we don't mind you being progressive, uh, you know, we're... Um, as long as you go labor, you know, um, stick with the party, uh, the machine. And, I, you know, the, I was like, okay, well, I go, why not this Hispanic girl? Oh, you know, there's just two Hispanic. You can go out against them. He was Hispanic. And I said, well, why not them? Well, they don't have any money. I was like, well, I, you know, how much money you want? And it's, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And, you know, it, the next day, I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'm like, no. And they go, well, you, you already told me. My guys are out there. I'm like, well, I'll give you money. Just go away, you know. Um, and I'll run for alderman. The next day, give me that petition for alderman to print it. That I, My window was broken and nothing on the seat but that petition for alderman. You know, it's like, oh, this is how it works, you know. Um, people had told me, but, you know, you can't run. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll hurt your family. They'll, you know, I'm like... My family's too mean. You, <laughs> they're all Republicans. They're not going to get them, right? But um, it's it is weird, you know, because it is just pure fascism. And the the hard part is, you know, that you feel like you're. We've done this before. You know, history is repeating itself. It um, it's a nightmare. You know, uh, once they do to them, they're gonna they're doing to me and. Uh, but also the most frustrating is the media because people have been miseducated. They, I did market research and I look back and what we did was let's, a random sample of 300 people, what do you want, what do you think, who are you? Okay, 80% liberal, you know, 80% want to save the planet, good. Um, then you look at, that's representative statistics. Back in the 80s or, or the 90s and nots, they came up with discrete choice analysis. It's like, do you want the planet or do you want money? Okay, here's, you know, you people get to be Democrat, you get to be Republican. And meanwhile, every, there's war, there's money, trillions, 26, 21 trillion dollars spent on forever war. That's called, you know, a one party system. They just call it two to give us a, an illusion of choice. They've got us so confused. That's why we, as a man I was talking to earlier said he'd never seen before a war, you know, science. You never has truth and science been in a, a war on it and just being tolerated. You, we just, I, maybe I was wrong that I thought in the good old days people understood science, but I, I do think the curriculum back then was, they came up with public education because people, they had to teach people to be moral, but they had, John Dewey had a lot of influence in the first part of the century, that people be educated voters. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson talked about that. So, more regulation for truth, you know, that's all we're asking for. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. On my uh, Thursday night, this is on, right? Kind of okay. Whose glasses, by the way? Hold your mind. Okay. I think we can all agree that there are some things that could change the political debate in this country. And I heard a really good argument for a rather obscure issue that really might 
change the status quo in our political situation. And that is something we've all heard before. It's called term limits. Six years for congressmen, two years in the Senate. And I actually heard this from one of the Republican uh, congressmen running for it. According to recent polling, there's over 80% of Americans that support term limits. And with a little bit of concentrated action, I believe we could probably get this through. I'll give you a good example of why we would need term limits. How many of you remember the Moon Project? Or moon, the moon landing. How many remember you, the uh, late 60s? Well, in 1970, an obscure congressman was elected to the state of Illinois. His last name is Madigan. He's still there. There's a few people in Washington the same way. Now, I've witnessed that if you have a good election cycle and you have good people going through that election cycle, you're probably going to be better off and have a more healthy organization. I do this through the voluntary thing that I do with Toastmasters International. I mean, I have elections yearly. We have new people coming on board. So there's not the same political uh, retrenchment, recalcitrance that we see with some of these people. I honestly think that if we put a little bit more emphasis on term limits, we might start seeing some more of that churn that comes with bringing in new people in Washington, D.C. That's ridiculous. I uh, think that it might be a good thing to start looking at. One issue that perhaps maybe Democrats and Republicans could start concentrating on and perhaps maybe starting to make some effective change in Washington. One more point, and this is totally off subject. I think I'll save that one for another time. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Got a little time here. Let's thank our speaker, Andy, for knowing all the work and handouts you put together. First of all, I'm going to do my hand on this issue of term limits. Can you point to one study that will establish for me at what point in an elected official's career he turns bad or becomes ineffective? Any study whatsoever. Is it two years, four years, six years, a hundred years, or is it just a feeling you have in your heart? Is this what you make decisions on? This is the playground for people who think. <laughs> what year? Do you think we suddenly will automatically replace personnel and somehow automatically the new people are better? On what basis? Show them when they get corrupt. On what basis do you make this determination that the old people are corrupt and the new people are uncorrupt? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. I have said about this establishes it. Every contract contract we have, no seniority. When I hire people, I look for seniority, experienced people who know what they're doing. You saw that in debates. You saw people who have never held this. I wrote an editorial. You have to have people. Don't vote for anyone who has not served in an elective office, who has not had a position in government. You say, oh, term limits automatically. But you say, are your new offices better? No, you have no reason to know that. The whole party's corrupt. You have no, no, that it omnibus is. statements like this Drug have girl. no meaning whatsoever. I don't, please be quiet if you make no contribution. Omnibus statements, gen, wild, wild generalizations are zero. Science. It's meaningless. Yes, political science is what I asked for. Show me one study that tells me Someone in government, okay. in the civil service of the United States government, years of credible service is, is a basis of it. And that's what the government functions on, and it works very well. We are the best governed nation on earth. And suddenly you come along here and you say, have you compared us to compared to other countries? That's what I mean. You, you guys talk about, oh, this country is so poorly governed. But did you compare it to one other country? Why did Not they even one other war? country. 
$20 Deb, you compared it to. Our own editorial can eat them every Citizens single United. day. The millions of government agencies function without error, without mistakes. The mail gets delivered. It functions finally, and then you come up here and you say, well, we have to replace it. Why don't you replace everyone in the, the entire federal the civil ones. workforce every few years, and then think that this is an improvement. <laughs> now, this is the playground for people and who think, worse. not for people who are zero. <laughs> now, the other thing I'd like to talk about is spin. We heard it tonight, you get a spin. Instead of calling it global warming, they said, let's call it climate change. Everybody knows this argument began with, with the argument of acid rain, uh, it, produced by smokestack industries, and resulted in an acid rain, ruined the environment, atmosphere. The crux of this is the change to the atmosphere. They're burning fossil fuels. If you want data, you've got to have data if you're going to talk. I can tell you, you can go to the website, the Greens, and it'll tell you how much fossil fuel, coal, oil, and gas is being burned every hour in the quantities. And you can tell. Now that produces soot. It produces pollution. That pollution, <coughs> doesn't, the earth doesn't, can't cleanse itself. And that's why we have this here. But I have data that says, look at all this soot is being produced, this gassy substances. Then you can make a statement. Not just, whoa, 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 whoa. you know, oh, whoa, 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 do is that. that you know, that's not it. Now, one more thing. I, the Green New Deal talks about many things, like transportation. Now, I, I am amazed here, and I got a little irritated, and I apologize. But we've had books like Asphalt Nation, things about sustainable living in sustainable communities. The Green New Deal talks extensively about changing the transportation network. And then I've heard that all we have to do is increase, increase the, the fuel efficiency of automobiles, and that will be our green policy. No, that's that. Uh, all right, Charlie, a direct, a direct right. confirmation of term All right, I want to hear, Washington when, I, when, I hear the when I hear a legitimate discussion from an adult on term limits, I'll welcome it. Give me the literature, I'll give you my email address. You send me an article with a study determining its pluses and minuses, its pros and cons. Then why do we have the 14th or Amendment eliminating the president to two terms? I, whoa, 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 right. Why do we have the president limited to two terms? You know. Yeah. Yeah, how do you know it's better? Because how do you know it's better? Power. How do you know it's better? It's better because we don't have an entrenched Dictatorial How do you thing. know what study? Washington retired. What study do you have? All right, bro, we vote rebuttals. Come on, come on. That's not All good. Right. Go ahead, Joe. You got more to say? All right, you get the last word, Andy. Okay. No doubt at all. That's a crazy. <laughs> I love it. You have one president that's there longer than two terms. And he did a good job. Yes, he did. So why don't we do it again? Can be back there? Uh, I'll answer, uh, address a couple of things. I like the quote of uh, one 72-year-old virgin waiting for you in heaven. <laughs> but then they used to teach some people, uh, some religions uh, taught that. Uh, I don't know which one, because I, I've never been to Islam. But I have a couple of friends, and they, they teach that Islam is a religion of peace. That's probably a much not, myth, not yeah. They blame everything on Islam. It's like communism and terrorism. David made a comment. He said he'd like to hear more of a, um, a balanced debate. Well, <clears throat> merchants of doubt and others like it describe how you keep people in the dark is you pick one guy from one side that says, hey, the earth is flat, and you pick one guy from NASA that has pictures from the space shuttle, and you let them have a debate. And among people that don't know, that haven't studied the evidence on both sides, it looks like it's a debatable issue. <clears throat> well. Climate change 
being caused by uh, mainly it's okay. He mentioned the Little Ice Age. Well, this book uh, talks about how you can tell that climate change is a natural thing or man-made. He said we have sunspot cycles every 11 years or something, right? Well, <clears throat> when you have natural warming, uh, the lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere, I forget, one of them is the stratosphere and one of them is the troposphere, they both will warm at about the same rate if it's being warmed by a sunspot activity. If it's, if it's a natural warming of the earth due to the sun, um, those two atmospheres <clears throat> close to the earth and farther up, they will kind of warm together. But if fossil fuel burning down here at the earth's <coughs> surface is, is heat trapping gases into the air, the lower atmosphere will warm up faster and the upper atmosphere will stay cool. And in the last 150 years since we started burning fossil fuel, the degree of warming on the earth, uh, global warming, uh, the, the two graphs are parallel in lockstep with each other. As we burn more fossil fuel and put more and more fossil fuel heat trapping gases into the air, the climate goes up with it. The, the, the curves are parallel. <clears throat> there's, there's no debate among 97% of scientific academies all over the world that what we're seeing, the increase in global warming, is caused by human activity and mainly fossil fuel burning. So, <clears throat> Jonathan said we need non-corporate information. I agree with him 100%. That's why I, I get a copy of Censored News every year to find out the top 25 stories that they thought were 25 that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. That's still my favorite book that comes out every year in October. Charlie was absolutely correct <clears throat> in saying that I didn't mention electric trains or transportation or revamping transportation lines in cities so that people could bi have bicycle lanes. Uh, <clears throat> electric bikes are coming into their own. And uh, electric bikes electric bikes will have a battery pack about uh, the size of a couple of these things. These are lithium batteries. Uh, these things were science fiction 40 years ago. That fan runs for uh, you know a day on one battery. Wow! Um, Amazing. I made this up as a demonstration of technology that was all science fiction 50 years ago. <clears throat> it has a little little inverter on the side here. This this transforms 110 volts, uh, a 12 volt battery power into 110. So when you turn it on, it'll run a 110 volt light bulb. Now that's a 60 watt LED light bulb. It's flat. It's plastic. Uh, you can put them in trouble lights and things, but yeah, that that'll uh, that's a compact lamp bulb that screws in. 60 watts worth of light for 10 watts. It's uh, the new LED lights have dropped consumption for electricity by 85 percent on average. The average uh, 15 watt LED bulb will give you 100 watts worth of light. This thing will also charge uh, cell phones or laptop computers if you're out in the middle of nowhere. It has a regular 5 volt plug for like your normal cell phone chargers. Wow. On the front of this thing is like a car spotlight. Anybody hey. see how bright that thing is? Yeah. yeah. You can see like uh, almost a quarter mile down the road. That's better than my car. <clears throat> That's almost like a small airplane landing light. Those things used to use a lot of wattage. But this thing uses about 10 watts and it runs on a pair of 12-volt uh, nickel metal hydride batteries. These batteries have <clears throat> much more density battery power for weight. These aren't even the new lithium batteries. This is just a nickel metal hydride. But lighting technology of all kinds, all kinds of hundreds of different sizes and shapes of bulbs are dirt cheap. <clears throat> They're way cheaper to run and cheaper to buy than a, a a set of incandescent bulbs. The houses now, it's common knowledge among builders that uh, get their information from Rocky Mountains Consulting Service on building high rises, office buildings. They just built a, uh, they have a, an office center, a business center 
with, that's the size of 10 small houses, that's 15,000 square feet. He said the heating system for that building up in Colorado, I think it's in Boulder, the heating system for the equivalent of 10 small houses is the equivalent of 13 hair dryers. No furnace in there at all. And they're teaching how you heat room by room. Uh, common knowledge all through Europe, very, very few countries, none that I know of really have big central heating systems where you waste energy through the whole building to be comfortable over here in the, office, the room where you're in. They have zones, uh, their buildings are divided up into zones, so you spend energy heating and cooling just where you're at. And the <clears throat> Rocky Mountain Institute has been teaching since 1984 that you, you can eliminate 90% of the energy you use with inanimate objects, glass, insulation. Uh, air exchangers that will bring in fresh air, the old stale air goes out through it. So modern houses basically, they're teaching builders how to build thermos bottles shaped like houses. You live in a thermos bottle, it's not leaking anywhere, and it looks like an ordinary house. But you might have three or four layers of glass in the windows, uh, half a foot of insulation in the walls or more, and the average house, there's houses out in Chalmers, I've been talking about them for 30 years, they eat for 10 bucks a month. It's a toaster or a hair dryer is what you need for a small house. Canadians said if you build a 3,000 square foot house like what they have in America, you're going to need a toaster and a hair dryer. So there it is. Furnaces, typewriters, eight track tapes, floppy disk drives, incandescent light bulbs, furnaces, they are all obsolete for what we have to build right now. These things are all here. Like Greta was saying at that climate conference, is. We don't need to study and learn anything new over the next few years to solve the problem. All the material and the equipment and the knowledge and everything to get off fossil fuels is economically advantageous, along with being highly, highly possible. And it's happening where people are able to override the billionaires that own their local media and own their local utilities. So. I would, for those of you that don't have time to read a lot of books, if you have access to a smartphone or a computer, just log on to that one website, Common Dreams, every day. They post the best of the best there. You see, uh, the three my favorite sites are Common Dreams, Truth Out, and The Smirking Chimp. Some of these articles came off The Smirking Chimp, uh, but they, they're printer friendly two or three pages, and the man spent his whole lifetime studying it. Wrote, wrote several books on the subject, but you can get a two and a half, three page article that just summarizes his life work. And um, I don't know what we did before we had the internet. Okay, and we had to spend oh, months in a library right. reading books. Yes? Where, where was that, informa that information about um, how to differentiate between whether it's man-made or, uh, or not man-made? Where, where did you get that information from? I'm just curious. I'd like that to came out of... Uh, Where's my book? I'm interested in looking that, at that, that myself. That came out of a book called Merchants of Doubt. Oh. Um, okay. Somebody, somebody okay, I've book. heard of that book. What? Yeah. Somebody ripped off my Merchants of Doubt, or is it still here? Huh. Well, it's around here somewhere. Somewhere, but it's, no. I ripped it off myself okay. and buried it. <coughs> Merchants of Doubt. It's uh, Naomi Varescus and Eric M. Conway. This is how a handful of scientists obscured the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming. This book actually is, is about the science of global warming and describes how, what I just told you, there's, I can't remember where it is in here, where they, they talk about the, up, the upper atmosphere. Back a road, or the road. I make notes on the, the first page the ear, ear market. It's in here somewhere. This is the book that talks about it, about how you can tell if global warming is natural or man-made. Turn that off, please. Wait, wait. We're not quite finished. I think there's a, a dog here. Can you turn that off? Yeah, we can turn it off. A documentary on that, by that same title on YouTube called Merchant of Doubt. Yeah, this is probably out available as a disc, a documentary, but uh, Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, is just, it's so, the narrator, is so easy to understand. It's easy listening and very understandable and clear. It's the best thing on climate that I've ever seen for a, a, a documentary. Also, it's uh, about climate change. <clears throat> yeah, Naomi Klein's book. Yeah, 
That's, Has uh, it been made a documentary? That, that, well, she's got she's got documentaries out too. Naomi Klein. She's world famous oh, for yeah. climate activists. This one, you, he okay, just told us to watch this, right here. That's not mine. That's somebody else's. That might have been Jonathan. No, but climate of doubt is what uh, yeah. Jean gave of doubt us. That Jean's it's a about DVD. That. Yeah. That's a DVD. Climate, climate of doubt is a DVD. Yeah, yeah, politics of global warming. I haven't seen that one myself, but yeah. Get that All right, let's finish up. Let's, so let's wrap up, and uh, we're just about a quarter to nine right now. So you don't, all of you know they want to get us out of here quick and vacuum yeah. up. So wrap thank us you all up for coming, and uh, we will see you next week. Yeah. Yeah.